Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the, the um, second lecture of the afternoon, which is given by Professor Helen Margitz. She is Professor of Society and the Internet. Um, she's head of the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, previously, she was Professor of Political Science at UCL, where she was also um, Director of Public Policy. She's on the advisory board of the UK Government Digital Service. Her work is um, very much about digital government and government citizen interactions in the age of big data and the internet. She is a prolific publisher. Um, she has a very celebrated book from 2007 on the tools of government in the digital age. And um, very recently with her three of her colleagues in Oxford, 2015, she's published a new book on political turbulence, um, how social media shape collective action. And actually, this is a particularly appropriate week to have her here because um, the book has just been highlighted in The, um, in the Economist, in its, its uh, special issue, where they said that this is a book that um, changes the way political science is going to work. So it's a, a very great pleasure, Helen, to welcome you to come and talk to us on the data science of politics. Oh, and by the way, here is her book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I will be a faculty fellow of the ATI, and I was involved right from the beginning um, in Oxford's bid to be part of the ATI, um, and was very keen that um, my department, um, the Oxford Internet Institute, which is in the Social Sciences Division um, at, uh, at, of, of the University of Oxford, should, should be uh, a kind of key act actor in the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and that's very pertinent to what I want to talk about. So I guess I want to say why I think that um, social science, social science in Yes, that's all right. Um, <laughs> social science in general um, should be part of the ATI, um, why that will be good for the ATI, and why data science um, will be good for uh, social science, and therefore, I believe, um, good for all of us. Um, so I wanted to kick off by saying um, what social science got to do with the Alan Turing Institute, um, in case anybody here is wondering um, and was too polite to ask. Um, and I guess that, uh, uh, I, I mean, before I do that, I should say something about what, what social science actually is, because the, probably the majority of people here are not, um, are not social sciences. Um, and so social science actually has um, grown up in a number of disciplines. I guess these are the most um, prominent disciplines of social science, economics, sociology, political science, anthropology, the human side of geography or, or, or political geography. And in those disciplines have grown up kind of decades of understanding and measurement of human behavior, basically human behavior, interactions between humans, social behavior, institutions, economic and political and social institutions, and interventions, i.e. public policy, what, or what policy, um, what happens when you intervene in the social, political, or economic world. Um, and actually, when you think about it, um, and, and there was an interesting article uh, three or four years ago by the political scientist Nicholas Christakis, arguing that actually social science has changed very little over decades. You know, the kind of boundaries between these, these disciplines have been much more kind, kind of rigid, if you like, than perhaps in, in um, the science disciplines. Um, Luciano mentioned, for example, biochemistry. Um, although there is a subfield of political economy, for example, you don't tend to see departments of political economy. Um, we haven't sort of gone to that stage of sort of innovation in terms of, of disciplinary thinking, although there will be plenty of people um, who, who might suggest counterexamples to that. But I think as a generalization, it does work. And what's happened to social science during the last 20 years? Uh, years or so, or, or, or since the advent of the internet, um, and the kind of things that Luciano has been talking about, is we've seen a big shift, um, a big uh, change to the subject 
of social science. That is, all our lives are intertwined with the internet, with social media platforms, platforms of the sharing economy, digital technologies of all kinds, the internet of things, <coughs> social media. Um, and that, that's a big change to our lives, and people in institutes like, uh, or departments like the Oxford Internet Institute are busy analyzing that change um, and thinking about what that means for um, human behavior, human life as a, as a whole. But it also means a change for the social sciences, the disciplines that study um, human beings, because of the data, because of the phenomenon that we're presumably part of the reason why we're all here, the fact that we're all dripping with data as we go about our daily lives. And that's a big shift for social science. Why? Because social science has traditionally lacked data, or at least it's lacked the kind of data that we're talking about. Most of the data um, in social science disciplines has traditionally come from surveys, basically. Um, exercises where people, um, some representative sample of people are asked some questions about what they did, or at least what they think they did, and anyone who's analyzed electoral data knows it's quite impossible to recreate the result of an election from what people said they voted, even if you ask them as they come out of the polling station. For all sorts of reasons, people either don't remember, or they think they voted and they didn't vote, or they think they didn't vote and they did vote, or they don't want to tell you what they vote, or they lie about what they voted, or they're ashamed of what they voted. It's very difficult, actually, to get at transactional data from asking people um, what they think they did or what they think um, and to do. So you can ask them what they, what they think, their attitudes, but it's very difficult to get any sort of transactional data. Um, most social science disciplines have, in general, lacked transactional data, but I'll say a bit more about that in a minute with respect to political behavior. But all this data that's being generated at the moment at least, is mostly being analyzed by data scientists or people within the disciplines that are most usually associated with data science. Um, the kind of original kind of founding disciplines, if you like, of the Alan Turing Institute, the mathematical and computational sciences, um, statistics, engineering, etc. cetera. Um, but it's data about people. But Quite a lot of people, uh, there is a tendency not to think it's about people. Uh, that somebody came up at some point with a statistic that 80% of big data is about people. I mean, quite how they work that out would be a very open question. But, you know, a lot of data um, uh, that we commonly call big data is about people. It was interesting when I was uh, talking to Oxford University Computing Services about our kind of bid to be part of the Alan Turing Institute. Um, uh, I, was, I was contacted by someone who, who said, um, of course, uh, do we need to do anything? He was actually talking about ethics, Luciano. <laughs> he was saying, there's no sort of ethical issues here, really, are there? Because it's not really human. It's not data about people, is it? Uh, well, actually, actually, yes. Yes, it is data about people. Um, but it's been analyzing, uh, analyzed in large by people who haven't, tri tri uh, by scientists who haven't traditionally analyzed data about people. They've uh, analyzed data about cells or particles or other things, but not in general people. So there is a sense that, that um, the traditional endeavors of the social sciences are now being undertaken by all sorts of people who didn't used to undertake them and perhaps aren't even that interested. People who didn't think, oh, I'll do a social science degree or I'll undertake social science research, but people who had some other aim in mind. And that is quite a dramatic shift. On the other hand, um, social scientists have uh, all this kind of cornucopia of data that might be analyzed to understand people, but haven't necessarily got um, the method methodological capability to actually um, analyze it. What we basically what we basically have here is people doing things in different parts of the forest. Um, it comes back to the discussion um, at the end of Lujana's lecture. Um, social scientists are working in one part of the forest and um, uh, machine learning people and people from the mathematical and computational um, sciences are in general working in another part of the forest. And I do believe that um, there will be, that, that, that one of the really valuable things that the Alan Turing Institute could do is 
cuts down some trees in the forest um, in an ethically sustainable way, of course, <laughs> to, um, it, to, to get at other parts of the forest, to, to, to develop some multidisciplinary channels um, for working together. Um, and that's, that, that's a key part of what I want to talk about, about just some ideas about how that might be done. But of course, these ideas inevitably come from my own part of the forest. Um, and when we, when, when I've tried to kind of sum up what that might mean, I guess um, the, if you can do it, and if you have to do it in three words, then the idea of social data science, data science that relates to data about people and tries to tell us something and explain something, maybe forecast something, predict something about people, um, would come into the category of, of social data science. Now, I'm going to use some data that we analysed to, uh, uh, to produce the book that Andrew mentioned, and that means I have to say something quickly um, about politics and political science. So apologies for, for, uh, uh, for that, for anybody who's, who always says I'm not interested in politics. Um, but you see, it's very short. It's not even a full slide. Um, so what is politics? Well, basically, if we take the most general sense, um, politics is uh, human activity, um, that's geared at pursuing some sort of common interest for members of some community, which could be a country or a village or a street, or it could even be um, could even be a university department. Um, any any kind of usually isn't um, <laughs> any kind of community of people, um, some kind of activity to to pursue the common interests of, of members of that community, um, and. Uh, where that relates to um, uh, uh, where that relates to a larger community of people, to produce some sort of public good, something that's going to benefit the whole community, although won't necessarily receive um, the contribution of effort of all the com community. And I could say many very interesting things about public goods, but basically that's what politics is about: the provision of public goods, things like anything from from clean air to social welfare. Um, uh, uh, to defense and security, um, that's what politics is. And political science, therefore, is the building up of systematic and reliable knowledge about politics. That's what we've been at for the uh, 50, 60, 70 years, however long um, you, you, you'd like to think that political science um, has existed. Um, I think we had a, I don't know if the gentleman who provided it is still here, I think we had a definition of science earlier. I mean, another um, uh, definition of, of, of the word science when it's attached to something else in an academic discipline that's been, um, that, that I've heard quoted, that is, um, uh, if something's got the word science in it, that means it most certainly isn't. Um, because if it has to say, I mean, like, you know, and people say with greatest respect. Um, we all know what they mean. Um, I mean, in fact, I would see that as, a, as um, I would see that, obviously, um, this is my part of the forest, I, I, I would see that as an unfair levelling against um, political science. But it's, it's certainly true that the study of politics really grew out of history. And if you look at what, if any of you have got children of GCSE age, what they're doing now is they're, um, if they're studying politics at GCSE at that age, at the age of 15 or 16, they're really either studying history or, or human geography. They're not, they're not stu uh, studying politics in a formal way. If you're someone like me, you think that's a great shame. But anyway, that's another story. Um, but it really grew out of history, the description of political institutions and elite actors, um, obviously, um, mostly um, um, sovereigns to start with. And there is a strand of political science that's very much devoted to that, to case studies, to ethnography, um, which still fulfill a, a very valuable role and stream of, of political science. Like social sciences, as I've said before, it's traditionally relied on surveys. Um, there's been a big lack of real-time transactional data. We've got data about voting, of course, when people vote, then we've got data about that. But we don't have that in a sort of individualized sense. We, it, 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 we don't have it related to any individual level characteristics. If we want to relate it to things like um, uh, people's socioeconomic status or their gender or whatever, then we have to go and ask them what they voted with all the problems that, that um, uh, associated with that that I mentioned. So, Really, basically, it's been, it's been surveys all the way. Other sorts of political um, data have been 
almost completely lacking. That doesn't stop us as political scientists being very interested in data about developing an, a, a huge uh, stream of heavily quantitative research. Um, we've certainly done that. There is a big, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the phrase that neo neocultural dualism, I think it was, that Luciano mentioned. There is a big quantitative, qualitative divide in political science, as there are many other social scientists where um, people uh, uh, think that what the other uh, group does is actually um, uh, not, not where it's at. Um, that's a very strong, strong divide. And, and, and uh, 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 from uh, there is a beginning um, to move away from some sort of, from survey data to some sort of um, uh, data not reliant on, on, on surveys, i.e. genetic data. But of course, genetic data is extremely difficult to get hold of, particularly if you've got uh, the word political in front of the word scientist. Um, so uh, that, that, that's quite small as yet, but it is a kind of, it is a, it is a, a, a kind of stream of research. But in general, the data we've got is, is it's small n, and it tends to be based on surveys. But at the same time, we have got rather kind of shifty about or, or snooty about the whole idea of description. Um, and you have seen a big shift in political science. The American Political Science Review, 80% um, of articles somebody has, 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 has calculated in the last 10 or so years are geared towards some sort of causal inference. Interesting, um, because that is, that, that, that is quite, a, quite a big shift. And the streams of political science that are highly uh, relevant to that are this quantitative analysis, big, big, uh, uh, big attention to new methods of quantitative analysis that sort of really came to the fore, probably from the 1980s, 1990s onwards, the adoption of statistics in the same way as you've seen in other disciplines, formal modeling, rational actor modeling, um, agent-based modeling, we've seen a big uh, 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 move towards that in some parts of political science, and then a move towards experimentation because um, the, the kind of belief that, that experiments, randomized control trials, is the one way we can really get a causal inference. That's been another shift in political science, also been shown quantitatively, um, uh, uh, and, and I could have shown you a, a graph of that. So those have been those have been the shifts in political science, but. Overall, there has been this incredible lack of data. Um, and uh, so all those developments have sat slightly uneasily with the whole um, big data revolution, as it were. Now, what's been the attitude of political science to big data? Well, there have been a couple of um, not very compatible kind of views about big data from political science. Um, one of them is that this is so exciting. Um, we've got all this data. We've never had data before. Big data, it's going to be absolutely wonderful. This is the end of theory. We don't need theory anymore. We'll let numbers talk for them. We'll let the numbers talk for themselves. Quantity is not quality. So that was one kind of, um, obviously most of political science wasn't very enthusiastic about that kind of um, uh, that, that kind of sort of parody of, 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 of the big data view. But it definitely was a feeling that, hang on, we can, do, we can do stuff we've always wanted to do and we don't need to do what we've traditionally done. That was one written. Unfortunately, of course, then uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as something happens like somebody shows that Google Flu Trends doesn't work on the, uh, doesn't work on the next strain of flu, um, then you immediately get a kind of on the rebound, you get people saying, oh, God, this is no use. All this data, it's not telling us anything. It doesn't really. It's completely not based on, um, on the understanding of, of human behavior. Um, throwing away decades of social science, absolutely ridiculous. Neither of those kind of diametrically opposed views are terribly helpful. And at the moment, we're at a kind of, well, it, it's great to have all this new data, um, but we need to work out how to use it, and we must keep theory in the mix. Um, and we mustn't throw away all the understanding and, and, and modes of explanation that we've built up over the years. Obviously, that does sound more, more reasonable, but the challenge is how, how to do that, how to develop a kind of data science of, of, of politics, if you like. Um, and although there are people already working in that tradition, I think we're fairly near the beginning, and that's one of the reasons um, 
as Luciano said at the beginning of his talk, you know, we're at an exciting moment where we can sort of start to, to build what we do, where we, we can make data science be what we believe um, it should be. Um, and for me, as a political scientist, but also with a kind of leaning towards um, uh, uh, that more, more kind of nerdish end of political science, having done my first degree in mathematics, um, uh, 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 you, you know, I'm very enthusiastic about that. And I would hope that the, uh, the, the, the book, which I'm going to talk about now, is a kind of uh, a few steps in that direction. Although, of course, we started writing that book well, we even started writing it before the big term. The, the term big data really had very much currency. Um, so, so this is the book, and the reason I've got a picture of the cover there, uh, including our, 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 the faces of the authors, not because uh, we're so pretty, but um, because we do illustrate this multidisciplinary point that Luciano was, ma was making earlier. So I'm a political scientist. This is Peter John. He's from UCL, actually, um, just down the road, not, 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 not from Oxford. Um, uh, Scott Hale, computer scientist, and Taha, Taha Yasseri, a physicist, both from the Oxford Internet Institute. So it really is a multidisciplinary book, and I never thought I'd ended up, end up writing a book with a physicist. Um, and to me, that, that's interesting, because it did make us think about what we could do with new sorts of data, what it might tell us, and how we could put that together with um, more traditional expertise in the study of politics and in political science. So the basic question of the book was how social media shape collective action. Collective action, collective action, some, some sort of political participation or political mobilization on a collective level in the pursuit of public goods. Um, what are the basic kind of, one of the basic enduring questions of politics, you know, how, how why do people get together in pursuit of public goods when, of course, if you have people campaigning or mobilizing around a public good like a regime change or, um, <clears throat> or a cleaner environment, you always have the problem that uh, you, you always have the free rider problem that some people can not participate in the mobilization but still benefit um, from the effects of that mobilization if it's successful. This is a very, very enduring question of political science, um, and I could talk about the history of that for the whole. Um, the whole 45 minutes, but I won't. Um, and what we wanted to do was think about how collective action, the process of collective action, was changing in an age of social media where so many of us spend so much time on, um, on, on social media. Um, so that was our aim. What does collective action look like in this changing world, and how can new forms of data, data science, help us to understand it, to explain it, perhaps to forecast it, to influence it even, or shape it, and harness political participation uh, for public goods, although that perhaps is the next step after the book's over. So I just want quickly to run through the main argument of the book and then to show you some of the sorts of things we did um, as a sort of offering of, of, of the beginnings of a, of a data science of politics. So we all know that people are becoming more and more um, online across the world, spending more and more of their time in online environments. Well, we tend to forget that that really is happening on a global basis. That um, I should change this slide already because it's got sub-Saharan Africa um, at 20%, uh, 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 and that's already um, um, beyond that. All those have gone up in e even the couple of years um, since that graph was produced. It's, it's changing, changing um, all the time. We're reaching near universal penetration be below a sort of resilient 10% um, uh, or so of, 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 of the digitally excluded in almost every country, uh, sorry, in, uh, across, the, across the developed world. And social media platforms are playing a big role in that. We tend to think um, Facebook is old hat, and in some ways it is. None of our children are using it. Um, and in some cases, we're only using it because we wanted to spy on them when they were using it, and they're not using it anymore. Um, but what you will find is the average um, teenager um, actually has accounts on about five. So 
social media platforms, and it's changing all the time which ones they use the most, and, and the rates of adoption of new ones um, is, is getting quicker and quicker than it used to be. And meanwhile, they're still using the old ones for some things. And Facebook is an example of an incredibly resilient platform that is actually really um, uh, uh, still increasing its presence among um, older generations. Um, and I think the death of Facebook has been predicted um, far too many times um, to be right. Um, but the key point about politics when it comes to social media, I think, is that all the time we're on um, uh, social media platforms, we're being invited to undertake a tiny bit of politics, to like something, to follow something, to share something. Um, and, and, and we're doing it, to sign a petition, to join an email campaign. Those are, those are bigger things, but just to, just to like something, just to share something. And all the signs are that we're doing that in huge numbers. In fact, there's substantive evidence now to show that people share things more than they read them when it comes to news items. Now, that is a little act of politics. You want somebody else to know about this, and you want, in some little way, to change their view. That is a little act of politics, even though um, it's very small. Signing a, a, an electronic petition, a, a digital petition, not something you could have done in a pre-internet era. And once you've signed it, of course, then you can share it with people. Um, you can display it to your friends. You can display it to as many people as follow you on Twitter. You can, you can push that little act of participation out into the world. And this, I think, is something new. It's something, it's, it's a political act so tiny, the costs are so small, that people are far more likely um, to do it than the much more sort of lumpy politics of the past. I'm not talking about money when I talk about that. I'm talking about tiny acts of contributions of time and effort. Um, but of course, it could be money as well. Would you have been able to, uh, you, you, you know, would you have given um, three pounds to help look after your local canal just because you were walking along the canal, it was a nice day, and the poster hits you just at the right moment? Would you have given um, this, this, um, this notice was actually um, in a restroom at uh, Heathrow Airport, political scientists never stop working, um, inviting you to contribute three pounds um, um, to um, this campaign about um, forced marriage. These very tiny quantities of money would have been very difficult um, to donate in the past. By the time you got your checkbook out and sent it off and found the right place to send it, um, the transaction costs would have outweighed um, the participation costs. So I'm saying that those tiny acts are very, um, uh, that, that they're important. They re reduce the transaction costs relative to the participation costs. Um, and they expand a sort of ladder of participation, which is the traditional way we look at it in political science. They draw new people into politics. Now this is, I, I may say, a rather subversive view in political culture, particularly in the UK, but in, 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 in many countries, but the UK is particularly extreme here. Politics. Um, has to be painful to be really politics. That is the predominant view in the British political system. You have to go to a boring meeting um, or go on some sort of march or, or something really painful. Um, that's what you, what, what you need to do. So this shouldn't really count. Um, that's actually a quote from Anthony Wright, who was uh, chair of the Parliamentary Public Administration Select Committee in 1999, which I gave evidence to. Um, very dismissive if you describe in that. People were in a sense of having nothing better to do than press buttons. I actually showed this to him at a meeting we were both at a, few, a couple of years ago, expecting him to be sort of ashamed. In fact, I asked someone else if, he, if they thought he would mind if I, if I did that. And actually, he was nodding happily when I read that out. Um, I think he, he is still of that view, and so are many people in, in British culture. So really, this is a subversive view. But what I'm what we argue in the book is that these very tiny acts of participation can scale up to very hu uh, very large mobilizations, um, which have challenged regimes of all kinds. Now, of course, in Tahrir Square in Egypt, those people in the square are taking, undertaking much more than a tiny act. Um, they're, they're taking a possibly um, light, uh, the biggest act of all. They're risking their life in the pursuit of a public, uh, of a political um, good. But the point is that the way they got there, 
the chain reactions between all those people who did things like click like on the Facebook page, we are all coloured, Saeed, of a young man beaten up by the security police, sent a vital signal to someone else saying, we might get there, there might be a million people in the square. And that, that, just that one Facebook page was at 500,000 likes by the time um, uh, uh, the, uh, Mubarak amazed everybody by uh, turning the internet off. Um, much to the jealousy, probably, of David Cameron, who's always talking about turning off Facebook whenever there's a riot or something like that. Um, but it's rather unlikely to be able to do it. Um, and of course, in, 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 in um, uh, uh, democratic regimes as well, um, Podemos, um, the, the uh, We Can movement in, in Spain has, has changed the pace, uh, ch changed the um, face of Spanish politics for um, a long time to come. Now these tiny acts, they can, um, they, they can scale up to large scale mobilizations. They can affect individual lives. How many um, refugees through um, last summer's crisis, well, and continuing crisis, how, how many refugees might have seen that photograph shared on a mobile phone um, and uh, 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 actually changed their course of action? That's a football stadium in, in, in Germany saying refugees. Um, welcome. Changed where people thought about going. 83% of Syrians, for example, have a mobile phone, and it's very easy to imagine that somebody um, choosing to leave everything behind and seek life in another country is going to um, is going to prioritise a mobile phone above other resources. And also, of course, these tiny acts they scale up and they achieve policy <coughs> change. So here's. Um, uh, um, uh, here's our first bit, um, uh, uh, here's the sort of bit of big data now by all of your standards probably, this is actually a very tiny, it's not big um, in, 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 in the size sense, but it's a complete bit of data for the last three years or four, four years we've been uh, scraping every single signature to every single petition um, in the UK and also actually um, the US. So that is a complete data set of transactional data. Every time somebody signed a petition, um, it's, it's, it's recorded in our data. So that can tell us something quite interesting about the petitioning um, community. We can do quite a lot about that. And to me, that is an example of the kind of data that political science has not really um, had before. Now, um, Everybody will have heard of digital petitions, and I'm going to show you um, some of that data now. Um, they have uh, petitions have actually um, achieved some kind of policy changes. Women on banknotes, for example, the end of uh, uh, road pricing policy, um, badger cull policy. Um, uh, if you, but of course, if you want to make um, something interesting um, to a UK, uh, I mean, if you want to campaign for something in a UK context, then. You need to choose a furry animal. That's probably going to do it. Um, but badgers probably have something. Have quite a lot to thank petitions for. Um, but what we see immediately, we look at that data, is that almost all these mobilisations fail. 99.9% .9 of these um, petitions fail, even to get 500 signatures. Um, the vast majority fail. Very, very few. The yellow ones in that graph there. That's uh, um, days over time. Uh, so, um, these are hours um, along the bottom and the number of signatures um, on the vertical axis. Um, only the yellow ones um, getting over 100,000 that are needed for a parliamentary debate. So those kinds of uh, data offer us new kind of numbers for political science and they are unable to us to test things like social media effects. They reveal natural experiments. They allow us to test the effects of platform design. They also enable us to, to offer some kind of geospatial analysis. Members of parliament particularly like that map of all the petitions because they can look at their constituency and see what people in their constituency worry about and where is this the same thing as they've been worrying about. They show us things, that, for example, they show us surprising constitutional th uh, uh, counter-intuitive things. We were really surprised by that, um, how far successful mobilizations develop straight out, um, those petitions that are successful going straight up. Um, we see that replicated over and over again with other sorts of data that we trawled from social media, from this is data from YouTube, for example. Uh, Neda Aga Sultan, the face of uh, the girl who was killed in the Iranian protest of 2009, became the sort of face of the protest. You can see here, um, straight up, 
to a million views on YouTube. Much more fr frivolously, Obama singing Call Me Maybe, um, the rather surprise um, hit of 2012, up to 40, uh, went up to 40 million, but to 10 million almost immediately, over and over again. Um, we, 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 we see that replicated. Again, we see it on uh, very resilient. This is data taken down from Facebook and Twitter, mobilizations against policing in the US um, uh, on, on the various hashtags that have been used. Hands up, don't shoot. Um, Black Lives Matter, I can't breathe. Again, either going straight up, uh, nothing, straight up, usually then a period of stasis, and then up again when there's been failure um, to indict police. These kind of mobilizations, I think it would be impossible to say they haven't changed the face of politics. You know, the whole judicial context of policing in the US, I think, has changed as, as, uh, as, a, as a result of, of some of these protests, um, which have started on social media and, and, and carry on on social media. You can't talk about politics at the moment without mentioning Donald Trump. Um, so here's a, here's a graph expressly, expressly for that. Uh, here's the petition to block Donald Trump from UK entry and then don't ban Donald Trump from the United Kingdom. Um, you can see there um, uh, both those uh, uh, going straight up um, as, I, uh, 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 as the other ones did. This shows all the petitions to the UK government on the issue of um, refugees or migrants. Um, o o o over um, the last few months, showing what a, what a confusing world um, policymakers, a sort of data world policymakers, all this is data for policymakers on what people think about um, the refugee crisis and migrants, but a lot of, you know, a lot of directly opposing um, contradi uh, contradictory views there, but also showing heck of a lot of uh, activity around the issue of refugees and migrants. This isn't is just expressing an opinion, this is doing something, that's signing a petition, actually being willing to do something and then share it on social media. We reckon that um, at least two million people have done that in the past, um, in the past few months. This is a model. <coughs> this is a model of how attention to um, uh, th those petitions um, decays, showing again that collective attention decays very quickly. Um, indeed, I'm sorry, I've taken the equation off there, uh, off there for, for a less mathematically advanced audience. Um, I should have put it back on again. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, basically, what it shows um, uh, um, it, it, it is that attention decays extremely quickly. Um, the outreach of, of petitions is, what, what, if something hasn't made it in 10 hours, it's, it's kind of digital dust. Um, and as you might expect, therefore, um, you've got a completely non-normal distribution of signatures. You've got what we see so often in internet-based worlds. Um, you see a few number, very dramatic success, and a very large number um, failing or, or with insignificant numbers. So this is a different kind of, of, of political world. Um, we, we're seeing some really important shifts in the political world. I believe that's what this data tells us. Um, the traditional social science predictors, like demographics, for example, we're used, to being, we're used to the idea, for example, that if you're black or you're young or you're um, uh, of lower socioeconomic status or less educated, you're less likely to vote. But where the costs of participation are so small, is that true anymore? Do those traditional predictors of um, political participation actually work? I think not, and that's why we're seeing so many surprises, like the mobilizations against um, policing in the US, like the election of a very old kind of establishment figure, but from outside the mainstream of politics, elected by quite a lot of, of, of very young people, um, Jeremy Corbyn. I think we've got G good evidence, and I won't have time, I think, to go too much into this, but one of the things we, we look at is if demographics don't work, what else might work? And one of the things we look at with this, um, uh, not with this data, but with some other data, with some experimental data, is the question of whether we can use something else, like personality. Can we use personality to, that, that, that's part of a growing body of thought um, in, 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 in political science, but done with surveys, not done with, necessarily done with experiments as we did here. So we did some lab-based experiments where we assessed people's personality and then looked at the different ways that they participated in public goods games. Um, we've looked at the effect of the two key things that we believe that social media 
um, importantly exert on individual behaviour, social information, real-time information about the participation of others. When did we ever know so much about what other people were doing? Um, uh, uh, as we do on social media. If you sign a petition on social media, you know immediately on real time how many people have signed, how many people are signing today. If you meet someone in the street with a petition, um, then you, uh, sorry, I'm being a bit 90s, um, according to Luciano's definition, but I mean, um, basically there aren't many petitions on the street anymore, but you, all you've got is somebody's word for it that loads of people are signing. Visibility and action of being visible to the outside world. We saw that used very persuasively um, in the ice bucket challenge. Um, uh, if anyone remembers, everybody having buckets of cold water poured over their head on um, Facebook and Instagram. These are two characteristics of social media that are influencing the way people behave, but we can model those. We can, we can use data dragged down from social media and other platforms to understand the effect of those um, characteristics. Um, so for example, in experimental settings, and I believe experimentation to be a very important part of social data science, we can look how different personalities respond differently to these different forms of, 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 of social influence. We found, again, counterintuitively, we thought that um, people with an individualist um, social value orientation, i.e. people who are um, uh, lack kind of cooperative characteristics and are more individualist, um, are far more shameable. If you make them visible, they're more likely to contribute to the public good than people um, who are of a more cooperative nature. That was quite, um, that was quite interesting to us. Um, so we've modelled, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll just you can look at the slides afterwards to, to point to the various places that we've, we've written about this, but you can use experiments to look at the effect of these different forms of social influence on people's, um, people's political behaviour. And the point is that new data sources are going to make that much more possible in the future. Um, I just want to mention one thing that I think is often uh, ignored. I was just at a panel at the Political Studies Association of the UK conference last week talking about a new book on the philosophy and methods of social science. And I noticed that the idea of natural experiments was almost kind of completely missing um, from the discussion. But the idea that you can use large-scale data um, to uh, uh, understand the effects of platform change um, and uh, uh, is an important one. So, for example, this is the uh, uh, this is the petitions um, uh, the petitions platform that I was talking about before. Um, they decided to introduce a trending facility so that you could see which petitions were trending. They didn't really think that that would make a difference to the way that people behaved on the site. Um, anyway, they introduced it. They do it in the U.S. seemed like a cool thing to do. Trending was a cool world word at the time. Um, the nice thing was that we were able to use the data, we were able to use our data to see the effect of that change, to actually measure in transactional terms what the effect has, as you might expect. Um, in fact, it did reinforce popularity and unpopularity. It made popular the ones that were trending more popular. That's the Gini co coefficient um, before and afterwards. It didn't change the overall number of um, signatures on the site, but it reinforced um, popularity and unpopularity. So the point about those dynamics, all those dynamics modelled with new sources of data or new forms of experimentation, is that they allow us to understand mobilisation um, in a digital world. They allow us to know something of the series of change reactions that get us mobilizations like this. Those are demonstrations in Brazil um, in, in, in 2014, where the president um, goes to ask to speak to the leaders of the demonstration and is told that there are no leaders. It's not that um, you can easily get that kind of number of people out on the street but it's possible to get them there without the normal trappings of mobilization, without organizations, without charismatic leaders, without any of the normal things we expect that revolutions or demonstrations or mobilizations to have. And that's a significant um, development. We believe that that's making politics a lot more turbulent than it used to be. 
um, that mobilizations are unstable, they're unpredictable. All those graphs I showed you like that, we were looking for S-shapes. In fact, we've had some furious arguments about why, uh, whether they could be described as S-shapes somehow with um, uh, eventually unrepeatable words being used to say they are not S-shapes. -shape, uh, <laughs> oh <dear. laughs> um, uh, the point is, S-shapes are easier to predict. That's how we expect mobilization to go. It builds up gradually and then tips over into um, really rapid action. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing rapid action straight away. More unstable, more unpredictable, and often unsustainable, as we saw in the revolutions of the Arab Spring. That's a turbulent world. It's a difficult one to understand, but I believe it is one that we may be able to understand um, with new forms of, of data and, and data science approaches so that we can get better. Politics has become more like the weather, basically. It's a dynamic system, it's more unpredictable, it's got greater sensitivity to initial conditions, more non-linear relationships in a networked world, much higher interconnectivity. Um, it's much more like a connect chaotic system. And if we want to model it, we're not going to be able to do that just with the traditional tools of political science. I'll, I'll move towards the end now because I know it's time to stop. Um, I just wanted to have um, a, 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 a kind of politics and a data science um, image just to end with. Um, I guess the task, I believe, for those of us who care about democratic systems, who want to, um, <laughs> who want to make dem democracy better, who want to think about how we can design democracy to um, reflect people's actual willingness to participate politically, um, uh, the kind of things that we need to think about. Um, we need to think about using these new forms of data. It would be crazy not to. And opinion polls are, are, are showing themselves over and over again to be less and less fit for purpose. Um, uh, there's a nice book called The Im Impact of Social Science written by um, another co-author of mine, Patrick Dunleavy, and his colleague Simon Basto, where they have an interview with someone from the Treasury talking to somebody from a major corp corporation, and the guy from the Treasury is saying, um, so, uh, 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 you, you know, I'm pretty confident with our data. We poll a 1,000 people every week. And the guy from the corporation says, oh, really? I looked at a graph yesterday of, of, of 200,000 people. I can look at that whenever I want, whatever second I want. It's a different, you know, that's a different world. And I think, you know, those are the kind of methods we're going to have to use to understand the political world. And there could be a lot of public good spin-offs in terms of, of how we understand the, the, the political world, but also how we make public policy better. And I hope that that's something that we're really going to think about um, in the Alan Turing Institute. We've already t started talking to a lot of people from across government about the different ways that data science might make public policy making um, better. So just to end, I think the turbulent world that I tried to sort of describe to you quickly is here to stay. It's not, it's not kind of going anywhere, although a lot of people would like it to, um, in, including some of the people that I've quoted. Um, it's just not going to. That's how politics is going to be. And we need to kind of catch up, as it were. Luciano talked a little bit about this. We're going to need the kind of, uh, we, we're going to need um, the mathematical modeling um, and natural science methods and data generation methods that come from other disciplines. We're going to need experimentation, and we've started with that in, in political science. We've started with that, but we need experimentation to scale. We need to work out how we can do um, natural experiments or, or use data to reveal natural experiments. We're going to have to try and do some kind of multidisciplinary machine learning, um, bring different parts of the forest together. Um, it's no good us all just sort of beavering away in, in our own different areas. Um, and that doesn't mean we've all got to, I, I don't know, form teams where there's always some, a social scientist or there's always somebody from this. That would be ridiculous. But we have got to find ways of knowing um, uh, what, what we're all doing. We've got to find ways of, of cross-fertilizing um, these different areas of thought and, and different endeavors. I'm not going to talk about ethics, not with um, Luciano. <laughs> That's why Luciano's here. But it's certainly urgent and essential that we have some kind of ethical framework for doing this. We've got to think about data sources. I showed you 
um, some data sources there, but all sorts of the data so that I might have showed you is locked behind um, paywalls or is locked within internet corporations. They've got the real data. We've got to work in partnership with them. We've got to think about making use of data for policy making. We've got to think of linking methodologies, of being able to link individual level data about people, um, demographics, personality, even genetics, to so-called big data, and, and social sciences really needs to take a lead there. It, it, I'm not suggesting we throw away opinion surveys. There's all sorts of really valuable over time um, uh, uh, survey data, um, data about attitudes and characteristics. We need to link it, um, not least the census, of course. Um, and we've got to bring, bring multidisciplinarity into the mainstream of both data science and social, uh, social science. I believe that that sort of endeavor would be, we could call it social data science, we could call it computational social science. I think I prefer social data science um, as it relates um, to the Alan Turing Institute. I'll stop there. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Helen. We have some time for questions. I see uh, John Crowcroft at the back is ready to roll. If you could get the microphone to the back, please. Um, brilliant speech, thanks. Excellent stuff. I love the turbulence idea. I wonder if the turbulence isn't something that's just uh, been around us a lot more. This is, I mean, I remember old school history lessons, and you're taught, you know, the kings and queens, and then you read, you know, when you get to be a teenager, you read Marx, and you get the story of the masses, and they're pretty turbulent. And, and I understand the social media kind of accelerates the turbulence process, but it would be interesting to see how many places, when you look closer and you have more data, you discover there's turbulence. And, uh, one area I'm, I'm trying to get a workshop going on is in peer review, where when you do any study of it, it turns out a very large fraction of the results of peer review effectively random. Uh, you know, where for 350 years we've assumed this is a really good way of ranking things and picking <laughs> the top. It actually turns out that, you know, and people have actually run interventions, experiments on this. Uh, and, you know, so maybe we should have a, an experiment on leaving Europe and just have a fraction of the UK leave Europe and other people observe the effect and then decide whether that was a good idea or not, right? So these are the kind of things we could try properly and do science. So I, yeah, it's just, uh, anyway, just, I, I, I don't know what well, the question is, is, you know, maybe turbulence is there more often and maybe that whole thing you're observing now is something that is, is around and maybe we should be looking at it for more places and then trying to get a better model that's not just a kind of very badly smooth fit with post-op rationalization or something. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, on the one hand, yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think there's some things that are new here about this kind of turbulence. I mean, the idea that you can, that um, the idea of chain reactions of very small acts of participation. I believe the very small acts is new. Um, that that's drawing great tranches. Um, of people, in, particularly young people, into politics. And we don't know much about how they participate because they weren't. Um, and the idea that you can get something going before the organizations, institutions, etc., exist, that is something different, I think, in that somebody like Jeremy Corbyn, for, okay, he was a politician, but he's completely without the organizational mechanisms to lead a party. I mean, almost the opposite. He's got kind of anti-mechanisms, like the fact that he's voted against the party whip so many times that people almost want to not vote um, uh, uh, with him. Um, and, you know, I think that that is a shift that we haven't seen before. The idea that you can get a revolution before you've got any of the organizational trappings of a revolution, that is a bit of a new. But the idea that we um, should have competitive models and should create, use data to create different worlds and run models against each other, um, I think is, t I totally, I think we totally should. Um, we should be doing it, you know, we should start tomorrow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and some people like Hal Varian and other, other people have argued that in different contexts. Um, and I think we should be trying to do it for the political world too. This question. Um, Helen, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, when I first read the book... Um, oh, sorry, can you use the microphone for the remote participants? I really like that, when you first read the book. <laughs> that implies that you read it twice. <laughs> when I first read, read the book, I, I, 
two reactions. One of them is, I think this is terrific. I, I, really, I really liked it. The second reaction, though, was actually, if you know anything about this technology, most of this stuff's not surprising. Uh, for example, you, we have power laws, you have lower transaction costs, you have uh, rapid, rapid, rapid scaling, you have network effects and all the other stuff that we've known about, for example, in, in the impact of the economic impact of, of the web, say. Um, and then the second thought was, I wonder what her colleagues in political science think of this. And then the third thought is, might it not be awfully like what's happening with the humanities and digital humanities? Well, I, I wonder, for example, it'd be very interesting to see how this book is reviewed uh, in your profession by your professional peers. Uh, and can you, can you really imagine the process in which, uh, for the next 30 years, say, within the political science uh, d discipline, um, the, the folks who, 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 who peer review the 80% of articles uh, that you mentioned in the American so uh, Political Science Association review, um, they're not going to change that much, are they? Or is, I mean, wh what's the sociology of this kind of transformation of your discipline? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It hasn't had, it has been reviewed in Science Magazine, but it hasn't been reviewed, the, the politics journals haven't quite got around to it yet. Um, I mean, you're, you're right, of course, and I think that would be particularly true on the kind of politics end of political science um, because it comes back to this kind of idea of uh, it's not important because they're only tiny acts and that's not real politics um, because it didn't cut dreadfully into the evenings, as Oscar Wilde mm -hmm. once said. Um, so. I think on that end of things, I think this could be, um, it could be slammed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I can really, I, I can, I, I could really see, see that coming. And that is a dominant view, and not just in my profession, but in yours or your previous pr profession. I was standing on a panel with Martin Kessel from The Guardian um, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was definitely, it was, it was, none of this has made any difference at all. That was firmly of totally of that view and obviously he's not going to like this book you know there's no way he's going to like it <laughs> on the other side of things on the sort of computational social science end of things i think i think i think they'll like the data they'll like they may disagree with what we do with it but it will be a much more data sciencey sort of um, discussion they might argue they might find flaws in our argument um, uh, I don't know, David Lazar, somebody mentioned um, that David Lazar, I can't remember who it was who, who mentioned him or, or, or Duncan Watts. I mean, they might, they might find flaws in, in the precise way that the argument is constructed or some of the mathematical models they might not, uh, but, but I think they will be more amenable to it. Um, in the middle, it's, it's hard to say, but I... I mean, the idea of that kind of data existing and being able to do something, particularly the petition signing data, I think, I think that would be at least a bit tempting to most normal political scientists. But maybe this is a hopelessly um, Pollyanna perspective. Right. <laughs> you, probably, you maybe know something I don't. <laughs> uh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested about signing the petitions. Is there any work to say? that it's the same people that sign all the petitions? I mean, it, it, or is it different people signing different petitions? Uh, we, on, we, on the internet? Uh, uh, we, we, can't, we can't use this. Because we've done this in a sort of ethically sound sort of way, we haven't kind of scraped names and addresses and stuff like this. Um, I'd say kind of serial petition. There's, there's an awful lot of petitions there. Um, I'd say that that would be quite a small, in, in that sense it is big data, that that would be a small enough. We did identify some serial petition creators. There are some people who create a petition every day. Um, <laughs> there really are. And we did use that to recommend, and in fact our, our, I think that recommendation was to, to recommend to the... Um, uh, to the parliamentary committee that um, they, you know, the threshold in the design of the threshold, because there is now a threshold for how many signatures a petition gets. There is in the U.S. already. That was another thing we did. We modelled the effect of the uh, of the uh, threshold in the U.S. Um, so it, it encouraged uh, because you can just get rid of them by having a threshold um, for the number of signatures. Because obviously, if you create a petition every day, 
um, it probably won't get that many signatures. But I mean, it's still important, and you should still think about it, because of course there is an element. We still don't really know, even after all this analysis, why some petitions make it and some of them don't. In that slide I showed you with the badger, you know, I can show you three badger petitions, same cute badger. Well, actually, badgers aren't very cute, but I mean, they, they scrub up well for a photo. Um, you know, one with 10 signatures, one with 3,000, and one with over 100,000. You know, so it's still important, I guess, if somebody is creating one every day. But in terms of people signing them every day, yeah, we can't, we can't do that. We can't yet do that in an ethically secure way. I mean, ethically sound way. Great. Well, thank you so much. For, uh, thank another you. fascinating lecture. Uh, let's thank Helen for... more questions. I, I certainly do. Um, there's happily an opportunity to ask them of both speakers. We're moving through to the Bronte foyer for, um, for wine and cheese. Um, this, as I said at the beginning, is, is the third lecture in a series of five that are the, really the first open events that we've run from the Turing Institute. I'm, um, I must say I'm particularly excited that we've been, been able to include this lecture because it really does make this point that we aim to be a multidisciplinary institute. It would be tempting when you get a bunch of uh, scientists and uh, engineers, mathematicians together to sort of um, nucleate on a very technical focus on data science, but this is absolutely not what we want um, to do. Of course, we will do the deep um, technical scientific work on the one hand, but we absolutely want to be influential, to be engaged, uh, with, with society to use uh, technical insights to um, help with um, issues of societal importance and conversely to use the, um, uh, the um, uh, arts uh, viewpoint and ethics to inform everything that we do in science. I think this is one of the things that's going to be particularly exciting about the new institute. I really look forward to doing more of it. In two weeks' time, we have the next lecture in this, this series, which is... Um, uh, the theme is data science in industry, and we have a, a speaker from Amazon um, uh, coming, to, coming to talk to us and one from Oracle. So um, one or two housekeeping things I uh, am asked to say as you go out. Please return your badges for recycling. Um, please do go online and see the um, online after effects of these lectures. We have a um, a, a channel on YouTube. There's the opportunity to register your, your views about the lecture. Please take that opportunity. I uh, want to thank the Alan Turing Institute staff for organizing another lovely lecture, uh, including the wine and cheese, which I hope you will come out and uh, um, enjoy with us now. So for both lecturers, again, thank you so much for a fascinating afternoon. <laughs>